Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's Data Bytes, getting things done with data in government, supported by the Geospatial Commission. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you to this evening's Geospecial. Let's start in the usual Data Bytes way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. And hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. If you're wondering what on earth that was about, it's something we used to do when we met in person. Think of it as our version of the legacy hand. This is our 20th Data Bytes, and we've touched on location data before, but this is our first event dedicated to the importance of geospatial data. Wherever you're located tonight, Data Bytes is the place to be. Data Bytes and location data, a perfect marriage without a Mumford & Sons Tribute Act in sight. Before we properly get going, let's start with some housekeeping. We are on the record and are being live streamed, obviously. If you're on Twitter, you can join in on hashtag IFG Data Bytes, and we're live tweeting from at IFG events. And you're probably watching this on Slido already. You can use the Q&A tool to put questions to our speakers. If you're not, follow the link on screen. Why do we run Data Bytes? Data is a small word that contains multitudes. We want to bring the different data communities in and around government together. We want to show people, especially those who don't think of themselves as data people, what better data can mean in practice. And we want to put some interesting projects and programs on the record for people to learn from. How does Data Bytes work? Well, you're going to be treated to four presentations by four excellent speakers this evening. Each of our speakers will have eight minutes to present. Yes, just eight minutes. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. You can hopefully see the timer on screen. After that, I will put your questions to that speaker for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. Then we'll move on to the next presentation. So four presentations, each lasting for eight minutes and each followed by eight minutes of questions. If you'd like to watch the previous 19 events, that's last month's excellent lineup on screen, you can find them all on the IFG website by following that link. Now, one of the sadnesses of doing this event online is, questions to our speakers aside, not being able to involve you, our wonderful audience. I'm really sad not to see you laugh at all the jokes. You'd have thought the eight events we did hold in person would have prepared me for that. Nonetheless, this evening, I thought I'd start with a quiz. Which major event of the last month does this chart illustrate? And what do the bigger grey circles represent? You can see it ranks top to bottom and the years run from left to right. The chart has lost a year in 2020, haven't we all? I'll come back to it in a minute or so. In the meantime, it's been yet another quiet month in British politics. First, the by-election bonanza. The Conservatives won in Hartlepool, only the third government gain in a by-election since 1979. This is how the swing compares to what normally happens. The SNP held Adrian shots. Tracy Braben's mayoral election victory means we have a by-election in Batley and Spen to add to the one in Chesham and Amersham. And we may yet get one in Delhin if Rob Roberts is forced to stand down from Parliament. Then we have the devolved elections. In Wales, Labour won 30 out of 60 seats to remain in government. They've been there ever since 1999. A regular reliable rhythm, as First Minister Mark Drakeford might say. In Scotland, the SNP's 64 seats fell just short of the 65 needed for a majority. But as you can see, there is still a majority in favour of independence in the Scottish Parliament. And in England, while the Conservatives made gains in local councils, Labour won the new West Yorkshire mayoralty and gained mayors in the west of England and Cambridgeshire and Peterborough. Not quite as bad a set of results as Labour's reaction might have suggested. I mean, sacking your deputy leader as party chair is one thing, but subjecting yourself to Piers Morgan... Now we come back to our quiz to see what you think about things. Apologies if you're still making your mind up. It's a chart that could have been all kinds of everything. But congratulations if you correctly identify that the grey dots are showing the UK's placings at the Eurovision Song Contest. You can see the UK's performance drop off considerably in the 21st century. In 2021, for just the second time ever, the UK was left with no points. But someone with lots of points, and speaking of making ourselves unpopular in Europe, was Dominic Cummings in his epic select committee appearance last week. In seven hours, the equivalent of nearly six databytes events, the Prime Minister's former advisor covered a huge amount of ground on behind-the-scenes pandemic preparedness, with criticism of the Prime Minister and his new wife, the Health Secretary and much of the apparatus of state. There's a brand new IFG report on that evidence out today. Now, the transcript of that select committee appearance runs to 61,656 words. That's a lot of words. How does it compare to some great works of literature? Well, it's not far off a couple of Mr. Cummings' favourite books, Philip Tetlock's Super Forecasting and Andy Gray's High Output Management. 
It's a bit shorter than Brave New World in its dystopian landscape where one man speaks out against the regime. It's longer than the national data strategy. The government's consultation response was published a few weeks ago. It's a few thousand words longer than War of the Worlds and Lord of the Flies. Continuing the audience participation theme, I'll let you fill in your own jokes there. But, and I promise you I'm not making this up, one of the notable works of literature closest in length to the Cummings transcript, a couple of thousand words longer according to some sources, or just a few hundred short of it according to the one we've used here, is the Stephen King classic, Carrie. The story of a young woman called Carrie, who uses the powers at her disposal to exact revenge upon her enemies, was just one of the narratives Mr Cummings raised during his evidence. But to finish on a serious note for once, at just three and a half thousand words is the transparency notice for GPDPR, or General Practice Data Planning and Research. Unlike its unrelated near namesake, GDPR, details of it will not have flooded your inboxes. It's a new NHS digital initiative which aims to use patient data, data about all of us, to improve services and policy and in research. All laudable aims. But as campaigners have pointed out, the public hasn't really been made aware of the plans or how to opt out of them. We've said many times before that if government and the public sector wants to make the most of better data and new technology, it really needs to bring the public with it or risk losing the opportunity. It's not just us saying that. The government's own Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation said much the same thing in its report on technology use during the pandemic. This really is the sort of area where government needs to have the conversation in public and with the public. And having conversations about data in public and with the public are our fantastic speakers this evening. First, we'll hear from Talia Baldwin, Director of the Geospatial Commission, who'll be setting the government context for location data. She'll be followed by Professor Sir Ian Diamond, the UK's national statistician, who'll be talking about unlocking location data for the benefit of the UK. After Ian, we'll hear from Professor Louise Heathwaite of Lancaster University and the UKRI Natural Environment Research Council, who will be talking about a systems approach to land use decisions. And last but not least, we'll hear from Heidi Mottram, CEO of Northumbrian Water Group, on location data innovation in the water industry. The next Data Bytes will be at 6pm on Wednesday the 7th of July, the last Data Bytes before the summer break. But Data Bytes will return, suitably refreshed, in September. Note that will be the second Wednesday of the month before we return to the first Wednesday of the month from October. We're only able to keep Data Bytes going thanks to the support of partners, so we're incredibly grateful to the Geospatial Commission for sponsoring tonight's event. If you'd like to follow in their virtuous footsteps, please do email my colleague Pratesh. And if you would like to follow in the footsteps of any of this evening's presenters or know someone who should, please do email me. As ever, we'll be having some virtual drinks after tonight's event. Please do join us. I'll put these details on screen again at the end, but the link is bit.ly slash db20drinks, password ifgdb20, or case sensitive. That, let's get our geospatial special underway with Talia. Talia, over to you. Thanks very much, Gavin. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, able to present a geospatial themed data bytes. It's very exciting. Um, so while I line up to share my screen, uh, I hope that actually other presentations I know will take the opportunity to showcase the really good work that's happening in government and outside of government that depends on location data. Uh, and I'm assuming that you can see my slides there. But so I'm going to talk about um, the development of the UK geospatial strategy and hot off the press, we have just published our annual plan today, um, which summarizes what we've done so far and sets some priorities for the future. So I'm gonna spend the next eight minutes talking about what we've done so far. So just a brief recap about the, uh, the remit of the geospatial commission in case you've not heard of us before. We are an expert committee in the cabinet office and we have responsibility, responsibility for setting geospatial policy for making some targeted investments in data improvement priorities. And we also hold the contracts for public sector access to core location data assets, most notably with Ordnance Survey. We collaborate really widely with our work, both in Whitehall, but also at a local level across England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. Uh, and we work with businesses large and small to deliver our collective ambitions. So what, what have we done so far? Well, we've published the UK geospatial strategy, and this is our strategy on a page. We've set up a, a fairly high level vision for 
uh, the UK to have a coherent national location data framework by 2025 and have identified nine location data opportunities set out there. Uh, and then alongside those four missions that essentially set the blueprint for how we will deliver to the, the high level vision. And what we've done uh, so far in the first year of the strategy is to take some steps uh, towards the, the five year targets through piloting some key programs in the nine location data opportunity areas. We've done a lot of work gathering sector specific evidence and also evidence about the value in the geospatial data markets. We've also initiated some conversations about people's perceptions of location data privacy and use. We have relet the geospatial data contracts that we have that provide for public sector access, as I said, upgrading the data capabilities and assets there. And we've also started some early work exploring standards, uh, most notably with unique property reference numbers, where we have provided access through an open government license to those and mandated them as a for common use across the public sector and the private sector is really interested in those as well, especially in housing. So our year in numbers brings out some of what we've done last year. As I mentioned, we have done some evidence gathering that included publishing uh, quite a focused bit of economic work with Frontier Economics in December, our geospatial data market study that identified um, both some real value with geospatial data companies and also some real challenges with getting to grips with how you define geospatial data, let alone the value of the activity that's going on across the UK. We have also worked with quite a lot of organizations so far, uh, 40 alone in the pilots that we've run for underground assets in northeastern London. We have taken on the government geography profession, which is growing 1400 members so far and uh, growing very fast. Uh, and that's because we want to align the capabilities that the strategy is setting out with the aims and objectives of the geography profession. And we've seen some really interesting positive impacts of new uh, the new master map threshold that we put into place through reletting the public sector geospatial agreement. So 1,400 new companies are accessing ordnance surveys data for the first time from last year, which is quite a high number, I think. So geospatial data is crucial to lots of the UK's priorities. Our annual plan creates an updated frame for how we talk about our work deliberately to try and keep the priorities up to date. It therefore highlights some key policy themes that should be not surprising to you all. Hopefully you'll recognise how important these things are and how the government's talking about them. Uh, and so those are uh, supporting economic recovery, helping meet net zero targets, underpinning the UK's international standing as a leading geospatial nation and digital nation, and then delivering uh, a significant upgrade in the public sector's geospatial data capabilities. So for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about um, the missions and the work that we're doing this year under those in this frame as well. So our first mission is around promoting and safeguarding the use of location data. We have done some key work, as I said, understanding the market for geospatial data and how we realize economic value. So we'll be building on those insights provided through the economic analysis uh, and linking it to our emerging innovation approach. We're also continuing the public dialogue that we've initiated to understand people's perceptions and confidence in location data use. And we have a new project to understand where the value in improved location data lies and how we clearly articulate it to support investment. So this is key work that underpins some of our target priorities in mission two, which is about improving access to better location data. So we'll be taking forward our National Underground Assets Register pilots into a programme proper and say more about that later this year. We are initiating an interesting new programme about land use uh, to try and address um, a strategic issue uh, that, um, that has arisen more prominently uh, in recent years where land is a finite resource and there are competing priorities for its use and how on earth do you get together the data to make decisions about how best to manage those competing priorities. So we'll say more about that in the next month or so, but it's likely to start with pilots in specific geographical areas. We've done quite a lot on public sector data improvements, and uh, we're now looking at testing use cases for earth observation data and also for mobility data. Not a surprise as well, as uh, this has been prominently applied to manage the coronavirus pandemic this year by quite a lot of 
uh, organizations across the public sector. We're also working with our partner bodies to benchmark the quality of the UK's core geospatial data assets. Mission three, uh, to enhance capability, skills and awareness uh, underpins lots of things we're doing. We really want to continue to work to understand the relationship between core geospatial data skills and emerging data capabilities, hoping to provide some practical advice for people working with geospatial data. And then mission four is about enabling innovation. Again, we're working this up, but we have announced last month another up to four million pound investment in a transport competition to bring to market real world applications of location data that maximize our transport networks. So for example, to boost capacity, reduce environmental impacts and decrease travel times. So please do follow our work. Uh, the strategy is iterating and we've set some clear priorities, but we want to be able to flex where others should lead or where our priorities change. Uh, and as the strategy develops, hopefully so will the profile and relevance of geospatial data so that we can collectively de deliver the transformative change we all want to see. Talia, thank you very much indeed. Um, I should say as well, you're one of, I think, three people now to have presented at uh, more than one data bite. So I think you were with us back in September uh, 2020, if people want to watch um, that after the event as well. Um, and just a reminder to everybody watching, um, you can get stuck in on hashtag IFG data bites on Twitter, and of course, submit questions via Slido. And we've got some great questions coming in already. So the so first couple of questions um, I've sort of grouped together. Um, anonymous and Asks, is the Geospatial Commission supporting the LOCUS Charter of sort of ethical geospatial data use? And Dave Lovell asks, is the UK currently able to populate all the themes in the UN's fundamental geospatial data themes? And if not, what steps are be ta being taken to plug any gaps? So I suppose how, how does the work of the Geospatial Commission relate to other particularly international initiatives? Yes, um, a key part of our work, because one of the missions uh, contains a set of emerging commitments where we want to ensure that what the UK is doing is recognised um, because of the good work of organisations outside of the Geospatial Commission that have existed for a long time. The UK's uh, got quite a lot of international recognition about, for the quality of its geospatial capabilities. The Locust Charter is part of the benchmark initiative and something that we've um, uh, been really keen to support and see step up. It's being delivered out outside of us, um, but uh, outside of the UK as well. And so it's really interesting to see the emerging conversation about location data and ethics and those key questions being raised. So yes, we've been really we've been really keen to support it and very interested to see where it's going to take us. And um, as I said, we're running our own uh, public dialogue to understand uh, or to try to get to grips with how people even see location data, how much they know about how it's being used, uh, how that makes them feel. And uh, we have committed to publish some guidance about that next year, but we'll make known uh, what we're doing through updates this year as well. Um, and we work quite closely with the UN. So um, we put in the strategy, uh, the intention to follow the UN's model for how it thinks about the components of a good geospatial data framework. And so we want to follow that in the UK's approach, not necessarily uh, giving weight to the priorities in the same way that other countries will, because the UK is set up differently necessarily. So we're involved in lots of U uh, the UN's groups, and um, uh, that includes at a strategic level and uh, at a kind of very technical level as well. And we have people embedded and, and talk to them quite often. Um, and they, they really look to the UK, as I said, not, not just the Geospatial Commission by any means, but our partners, the Geological Survey, Ordnance Survey as well, uh, the Hydrographic Office about, you know, what's going on in the UK and what can be the examples of the good work that the UK is doing around data and geospatial data. Excellent, thanks. We've got loads of questions coming in. Um, the current top rated one is from Sam from Med Confidential. Evening to you, Sam. In case anyone missed it, there was a pandemic over the 15 months. I think we noticed. Um, what did the Commission do to help that wouldn't have otherwise happened? How would things be worse or different if Ordnance Survey was still in charge? Uh, yeah, so um, we uh, so we set up 
to set the strategy. And so we try not to dip into things that are very urgent and uh, and we're not best equipped to deliver. However, uh, through our partners, including Ordnance Survey, some significant things did happen uh, to help with the pandemic. So I think one of the main things was um, through the public sector geospatial agreement that we'd relet in April, Ordnance Survey were able to come up with a um, uh, a data license that allowed uh, some businesses to access data that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to access. Um, and that license was open for uh, the time it took to really get to grips with that data and manage in particular local areas, some of that, uh, the transmission related issues. And so uh, there's lots of information about that uh, on Ordnance Survey website, case specific examples of that. Um, uh, and that was all Ordnance Survey's work rather than ours. It just happened to map onto the content Track that we have um, and through that we have also been piloting some capability that we have installed in bits of government so we had some people uh, with geospatial expertise uh, from Ordnance Survey in different bits of the government organisations leading the uh, the development of the data dashboards for managing the pandemic uh, and I think it was really great to have uh, a couple of people in the Joint Biosecurity Centre, for example, at ground level, um, embedding geospatial capabilities from the start. So you didn't have to retrofit anything. Um, and, it, and it really helped identify the kind of geographic wide um, uh, uh, go, goings on, but uh, similarities and things that could be improved and best practice across the different bits of the UK. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got a question, um, sort of similar theme to some of the others we've asked, uh, we've asked already. Uh, so this is from Anonymous. Good evening to you, Anonymous. How is the Geospatial Commission joining up with the national data strategy to ensure skills and use of geodata is seen as fundamental and integrated rather than seen as specialist? Uh, oh yes, we're in lockstep with the national data strategy, as you would imagine. So we have um, been talking to DCMS teams from the very beginning about the shape of that, uh, and have been very keen to ensure that what we're doing is is framed um, by the national data strategy. So it, it's not the same. There's elements of the data strategy that aren't relevant for the priorities for geospatial data, but there's really significant bits of that that really are. Uh, and so that that is around skills, but it's also around access. And and, um, uh, and the kind of policy and regulation that you need to have in place to make people feel comfortable to share their data. Uh, we have um, one of our commissioners on our board is also on the board of the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. So that component tends to link. So we try and make, uh, we try and join the dots as much as possible. Excellent, thanks. Um, this may be the same anonymous, it may be a different anonymous. Uh, thinking about transport, are you looking into rail and have you faced any difficulties accessing data there? Uh, yes and yes. <laughs> it's really hard, isn't it, rail? Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of rail assets and uh, not everyone knows where they are. Um, rail's not alone, that's the same for lots of other things. We found that for underground assets, actually. So we have um, we have had Network Rail as a, as a partner in the underground assets pilots that we've been running in different areas because we want to make sure that we're not just building in the utilities asset data, but the other relevant data about underground assets that, you know, where stuff is in the same place. Um, but we have, so we've done a couple of things with transport. We've run a, uh, a competition that I mentioned to try and bring forward some innovations that attempt to tackle public sector challenges, data challenges to do with transport. We've also run a series of industry roundtables. We're going to, um, we're going to publish something, I think next month, maybe, uh, maybe it might be the month after, where are we? Oh no, so in July, um, that uh, just summarises what we've been doing. Uh, I think we've blogged about it. Steve Unger, one of our commissioners, led the industry roundtables. And what we've done on the, on the back of those is to try and identify some common data challenges where, uh, you know, there could be some significant improvements across a range of different things. So road, rail, uh, other kinds of things. There's not very many of those actually. Um, and so I think we'll have to choose uh, how and whether we do anything at all. But I think it's an interesting conversation that we're having with the sector. And we did focus one round table on rail in particular. And so we'll definitely publish the, uh, the conversation that happened as part of that. Great. We've got about 30 seconds left. I'm going to squeeze one final one in. Uh, this is from Gary Todd at Famio. How is the Geospatial Commission opening up to and inviting conversation with startups who are currently innovating in the geospatial data sector and looking to adopt things like UPRNs? 
Uh, yeah, so we're doing a lot in Scotland, actually. We've launched, uh, we've invested with the Scottish government and Scottish enterprise in a, in a network innovator. So uh, Location Data Scotland, it's called, it's his umbrella, but it, it aims to provide a space for startups to talk to each other about location data improvements. And so we've, we've been working, because Scotland's been much further ahead with that, and so we've been keen to capitalise on that. Um, but our innovation competition focuses on startups and investing in work around feasibility studies, and we're just going to the next stage of that. And I think we're quite keen to make sure that it's uh, clear uh, the challenges that we're identifying so we can bring about some tangible interactions and benefits and also some realization of those benefits and so we actually uh, benefit from focusing on particular things in particular sectors when we're working with startups. Excellent well sadly Talia we've run out of time but um, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. And uh, sorry to those of you whose questions we weren't quite able to get to. I know there were a lot of very, very good questions that were coming in. Um, one was from David Vincent wanting to know more about the Geospatial Commission. Again, if you look at the September 2020 uh, data bytes, we had Talia speaking there. And there's plenty on the Geospatial Commission website, including the Geospatial Strategy and their latest uh, annual plan, which was out today. So um, we now turn to our second uh, speaker for tonight. Ian, over to you. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, and uh, it's a real privilege to be here. I mean, the, the importance of spatial data to ONS is absolutely critical, and for, for no other reason than society lives in groups. Uh, and although I'm going to talk about data tonight, I think it's also worth remembering that it's critical to bring that spatial element into the analysis uh, that done. And I think the work of multi level models, on which I spent a lot of my career, incredibly important because. People, observations in groups are correlated together and therefore we need to take that into account. It's also a very good reason for why we need to look at location data. Next slide, please. The first slide I'm going to show shows some work from the uh, pandemic. Um, and what the, this slide shows, it, next slide, please. Of course, the good news, the, the really good news, Gavin, is, of course, um, that you've got an old version of the slides uh, and not the slides uh, that uh, I was going to talk about. So shall we just forget about slides uh, and I'll talk about something else? Um, so thanks very much for showing the slides. Um, look, what I wanted to start off was just making a few points about national comparisons uh, in the pandemic. Uh, and we spent a lot of time this time last year. Uh, thinking uh, about uh, national comparisons uh, uh, when actually that wasn't sensible. If you actually went and looked at things spatially in small groups, for example, the European Union's NUTS3 uh, uh, groups, then what you saw, for example, for Italy and for France was a very, very clustered uh, epidemic, whereas the UK, you can show uh, by looking over time, had an epidemic which has seeded very quickly right across um, the um, right across the nation uh, and was actually a very national epidemic. Point I just wanted to make is that therefore making a comparison between the UK and Italy was not a real comparison. The comparison had to be between the areas, and if you made that very sadly. It was Italy that had the very highest uh, rates uh, of the pandemic in those areas where it happened. UK was actually, if you look at nuts uh, levels, much lower. That's the first point uh, I wanted to make. Second point uh, I wanted to make was to uh, say uh, a few words about some opportunities that we took uh, at the ONS. And one was looking at wastewater. Wastewater uh, was seen as a really interesting and innovative data source uh, to look at um, the extent of virus in the community. You might think this is really, really easy. However, the complexity of underground wastewater sources is incredibly uh, challenging to work with. Uh, and one of the great things 
of the pandemic, I think, has been the way in which the private sector, the public sector, government have really worked together. And so we were able to work at real pace um, with wastewater companies to be able to produce for the Joint Biosecurity Centre some really interesting ways of identifying the level of uh, virus in wastewater. But there are still problems because one um, point in North London has basically all the wastewater for much of North London, whereas a place like Leicester, there are many uh, more um, places to collect the water from. So terribly important to understand the complexity of what you are looking for. However, another example that we use, which I think is really, really interesting, is at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of identification of outbreaks in different areas of um, work. And so one of the things we did working with Public Health England was to map meat, cold meat pack, packing factories and textile factories, and then to map the location of people working in those areas, and then to understand the distribution. And this helped Public Health England to understand the potential for the outbreak um, identification and also the potential for testing and the importance of testing. So being able to take the location of a workplace to the location of the people who work there, bringing them all together, really, really important. Tal Talia mentioned, um, mentioned uh, mobility data. Uh, and we're very privileged that some of my colleagues have just won a Geography and Government Award for the work they did being able to, to use traffic cameras uh, to identify uh, movements of cars uh, of, um, uh, and, uh, and of buses uh, across different areas uh, of the UK. And indeed, you can also uh, use um, cameras to identify pedestrian movement. And of course, what you see is huge drops uh, at the time of the first lockdown, steady build up and then things go up and down as lockdowns come and go. We've also been using Facebook data to see mobility between local authorities. And again, that is a great source uh, of being able to identify uh, different trends. Uh, and you can, for example, pick out beautifully the Welsh circuit break, which other parts of the country did not uh, have. Uh, and, and I could go on about these data the whole time. But the point is, that throughout the pandemic, working at pace with different private and public sector organisations, we have been able to bring uh, location to the case. Now, we move into economic recovery. Uh, and clearly, one of the government's most welcome and really exciting agendas is levelling up. Uh, and we're privileged to be working uh, with the government, but it's very important to recognise the spatial location of disadvantage. I could show you uh, pictures of all kinds of towns. And for example, Blackpool is a place where there is heavily concentrated disadvantage, quite close to advantage. And if you are trying to um, target resource and target interventions, incredibly important uh, that we are able uh, to be able to, to identify those kinds of small areas uh, within big areas. Torquay, another fine example of enormous poverty alongside real wealth. Flexible geographies for spatial data, absolutely critical, as is identifying high streets and green spaces. And we've got a great partnership with the Ordnance Survey which enables us to identify shops and to identify high streets on the up and high streets on the down. And our current work is looking at geospatial data using, for example, um, local newspapers to get a sense of those areas which are moving up and those areas which are challenging. And a final point, ethics have been mentioned. I just wanted to say that ethics are critical to all of this. Ethics in terms of ensuring privacy in the data, ethics in terms of geospatial data of not, if you like, exacerbating uh, disadvantage 
uh, and ethics really needing an understanding of what the public good is of the research that is going to take place. It's a privilege to have talked to you. I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Slides or no slides, that was a, a brilliant overview. Thank you very much. I'm sure we can make the slides available after the event as well. Um, just to remind everybody, you can put your questions to Ian by using our, our Slido. There are plenty coming in already, um, so I won't waste any more time. I'll go straight to them. Um, a really good question from Dave Lovell. What development in the geospatial domain would make the biggest impact on the work of ONS? Really good um, question, David. I do think the much better um, spatial um, location data, which enable enables us to link location to many other things in uh, real time. And so absolutely having that, if you like, really close location data that we can then uh, link into all kinds of other uh, data sets would, I think, be incredibly helpful. Because as I say, the critical thing is flexible geographies and building up from the bottom. Excellent, thanks. Um, this this one picks up on your ethics point. Uh, this is from Sam at Med Confidential, who says 100,000 people are currently opting out of the GP data project, which I mentioned earlier. Um, NHSX not really telling people, and Matt Hancock wants more data to sell. What would you have advised differently to protect trust in the collection and use of data? I think um, we are all committed to public engagement. All the work um, that we do. So I'm not talking about doing things differently because I'm not um, competent to answer that particular part of the question. But I would say that um, public engagement is incredibly important. Uh, and we believe very much at ONS in engagement. So very much talking to people, not about can we have your data, but why are we going to use that data? How are we going to use data? So anyone using uh, data through ONS's secure research service uh, has to go through both an ethical process and an approvals process. And the approvals process is an independent group of people who look at the proposal and asks, is this in the public good? And will it maintain privacy? Uh, and uh, we would argue that working with um, are the public with whom we engage, uh, that people therefore have the confidence that uh, data are being used properly and in the public interest. Thank you. And um, we've got another question from Anonymous, who's having another very busy evening. How does ONS's setup as an independent government funded agency help or hinder it operate at such pace to innovate in a crisis situation? And how does that compare to Ordnance Survey and other organisations? I think it's pretty similar. Um, for us, um, I should talk about I mean, independence is critical, but independence does not mean irrelevance. So it seems to me it's entirely reasonable for us to be talking to government uh, about what are the questions that are important and what are the data that are needed in order to be able to answer those questions. The production of them is completely independent and then the data are the data are the data uh, and that for example uh, we have been producing uh, regional estimates uh, of the um, of, of positivity um, in the pandemic we do so every Friday um, and we talk to government about um, the types of data that would be useful but when we produce them, that is produced entirely independent and no one sees those data um, until we get they go out. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got about four minutes left. There's still plenty of time to bring your questions to Ian. Um, one that I just wanted to ask quickly was, obviously, it's been it's been quite a year and a bit for the ONS, what with the pandemic and also the census um, happening in the middle of all of that. What are the sort of biggest lessons that you've learned about what the ONS's work should look like um, over the next few years? Well, I think um, I'd say three or four things. Number one, uh, we need to make sure um, always that our data are produced in a very timely way. Uh, and so we've put a lot of effort in the last year into producing new, for example, economic indicators, which are based on 
um, data which are, if you like, of this week, not of last month. And that, I think, is something that is incredibly important. Secondly, um, we need to make sure that we are working seamlessly with partners, both across the public and the private sector, uh, and the, the need to build those relationships, um, which we've been able to do, um, is incredibly important. And that links me to the third point, which is I've, I've met, one I've made already, but it is about always understanding why data are needed. You know, there, there's no God-given right for us to have data. There needs to be a really sound public good reason for collecting data and using data. And people need to feel absolutely comfortable that um, their data are being used properly and kept securely and in a way that uh, satisfies all forms of privacy. And that, that's something we've worked hard on. And over the next few years, we will continue to do because I do think that the potential that we have now to develop data, to link data, um, can enable us to serve citizens much better than we've ever been able to do. We can answer policy questions now that I could only have dreamt about in my career. Uh, and it seems to me absolutely right and proper that so long as we maintain the ethics and so long as we maintain the public interest we do everything we can to ensure that excellent thanks um we've got another question from sam uh, we've heard the secure research service um, mentioned a few times he says it's a hugely valuable service what's the one thing that the public should know about it and arguably researchers as well well we work um very much to ensure that anyone using the Secure Research Service has no possibility of being able to overcome privacy. The, the work is done in a using five safe, safe, safe people, safe ethics, safe um, environments. Uh, and what we do is ensure that using proper ethics, proper approvals, and um, checking the analyses that people have done before it goes out, that everybody can feel comfortable that brilliant work is being done, which is adding really to knowledge for the public good, but to doing so very much in a way uh, which is safe, secure and ethically sound. We've got another 30 seconds. I'm going to squeeze in a final question from Alistair Burt. Is Parliament, not just government, helpful to you in explaining the crucial importance of data during the pandemic? Have MPs and select committees been keen to engage with you or wary? Alistair, thank you very much for that question. Uh, and I would have to say that um, MPs and select committees have been brilliant throughout the pandemic in every way. Um, and they have been interested, they have worked with us to develop, um, to, 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 to expect improved visualisation, to expect that we are communicating properly, uh, and they have been fully supportive of some of the initiatives we have made to improve uh, the way that data exists. Uh, I have been enormously impressed uh, both by colleagues from the House of Commons and the House of Lords uh, in the way uh, that they have engaged with us throughout the pandemic. That's a really positive and optimistic note on which to end. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, I should just say as well, Ian mentioned uh, the award-winning project uh, using traffic cameras uh, to track mobility. You can find out more about that at Databyte 17, where we heard from Ian and Lee, part of that award-winning team. And again, apologies to everybody whose question I wasn't able to put to Ian. Lots of great questions tonight. And we've got another couple of excellent speakers to put questions to. So without further ado, our third speaker tonight is Louise. Over to you, Louise. 
Okay, everybody, I hope you can see my slides and hear me okay. Um, I'm going to present a, a research perspective on uh, land use decision making and really want to reflect on the importance of the location data agenda in that. I'm an environmental scientist, so you'll get a lot from the environmental science perspective in this. Um, but just to give you a, a sense of, uh, of why it's so important to have geospatial data underpin much of what I've done and what many of us do in this in this research space. Oops, sorry, I've just gone too many slides along. So um, let, let's just start with um, reflecting on what we want from our land. Um, and I just want to give the, in, the sense of the huge ask that we actually put on land and land use. We want land to sequester carbon. We want it to reduce flood risk. We want it to provide food for people and livestock. We want it to provide homes and gardens and recreation, sport industry, um, act as resource, say, for example, in terms of mineral extraction and encompass our infrastructure. So that's a huge ask of that land surface. And this slide you've got up here is, is taken from a report um, that uh, a survey by Ipsos Mori um, commissioned by the Royal Society, looking at uh, a public dialogue on the future of land use. Now, um, you can see it's, spread, it's, it's in the sort of normal uh, uh, way of setting this up in terms of more important participants versus less important, less immediate versus more immediate. Uh, I don't think there'll be any surprises in what you see here, uh, top of the most important um, and most immediate is around com combating climate change, but also up there are things like biodiversity and food production. One area I'll come on to a little bit later because it's closest to my heart and my research area is around uh, clean air and water in terms of what we want from, from land as well. So I don't think uh, any surprises in what you see there in terms of the public, the public dialogue. Um, let's look at a number of different perspectives here. So this is just one perspective, one of the many different lenses through which you might look at land use. Um, and this is taken from a, a book by David Mackay. It's quite old now, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, still one of my favourite books. Uh, David was a, a CSA in, I think it was Biz um, at the time. And what he's done here is a, it's a slightly cheeky uh, diagram, but it's fully evidenced around, uh, it's a mock-up of what we would need to do if we threw if all the available energy, sustainable energy technologies at giving us a plan for Scotland and England and Wales in terms of sustainable energy. The reason I've put that up is it's slightly scary in terms of the, the scale of the commitment of land to actually deliver that, um, that sustainable energy. Now, we have moved on a lot since 2008 um, in terms of the um, issues around sustainable energy and the development of technologies. But the principle still stands that if you want to have a sustainable energy plan, then you're going to have to demand a lot of land and land use to achieve it. Um, and, and I think the, that's important in the context of this next slide, which was really reflects a really pivotal point last year in terms of, uh, of where we sit between um, the global human-made mass by dry weight uh, versus the available um, living biomass. So you've got uh, two line, the number of lines here. The green line shows from 1900 to up to 2020 the amount of biomass in, on a global basis. And what you can see by the rest uh, of, of this slide is the increase in anthropogenic, bio, uh, anthropogenic mass, not biomass, excuse me, in terms of adding to that um, land surface challenge. So things such as metals, asphalt, bricks, aggregates and concrete, all increasing the uh, burden, if you like, or the re support required from the land service, surface to serve those uh, challenges. And, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit about, you know, land cover and, and some of the demands on it. Now, this is a, 
The LUM cover map for GB, it's 2015. It's data that's supported by the Natural Environment Research Council. I've been a council member for a number of years, just stepped down from that in April this year. And this is uh, hosted by the Environmental Information Data Centre. Now, that is really pretty good geospatial data. It's a, a highly, you know, high, high resolution, high quality. But the key point about it is it's only a snapshot of land cover. It doesn't really tell us much about, um, at least from a systems perspective, about what the implications are of changing land use, safe to support energy, or to do any, many of those other things that we want of it. So to understand and make sense of land cover, we've also got to think much more dynamically in terms of some of the implications. And this next map is, is my own research area in terms of diffuse um, diffuse pollution. And what this shows is old data, 2000. Um, I expect uh, it hasn't actually changed that much in terms of the pattern. There are two maps here. The one on the left is the concentration of phosphorus in rivers. Uh, blue is good, red is bad, and the map on the right is nitrate concentration in rivers. Again, blue is good and, and red is bad. And what that's really showing you is the implications of how we manage land and the impact that land has on uh, freshwater quality. Now, of course, that's important because that in, impacts in terms of uh, clean water supplies. It also in, impacts in terms of um, freshwater habitats and those habitats are important in a, in a whole host of ecosystem services. Um, I just wanted to move on quickly to a project I was involved in which is a government office for science project uh, called Land Use Futures um, back in 2010 now. Don't expect to be able to see what on earth's on my slide, it's only there really to demonstrate that there's huge complexity in terms of the various influences on how we um, need to use land and how we understand land and what we what we want to get out of it. The reason I've put it up is because of the this is an Institute for Government um, session and I think the, one of the key interesting things about this connectivity if you like is that you can interplay on top of it the sorts of different government departments that have a particular um, understanding of some of that interconnectivity but to me what it really really shows is the fact that if you're going to make um, joined up decisions around land use, you're going to need to have joined up decisions across government departments as well, because different departments hold different parts of the data, have different lenses through which they view the data and different perspectives on it. And I think that's important to reflect on that as we go forward. Um, now that was 2010, this is now. Um, and since 2010, there's been a huge growth in two things. One, our capabilities in terms of data science and also our capacity in terms of Earth observation. Um, and this is a, a, a picture taken from another Royal Society report around the dynamics of data science skills. What I think is really important here is it basically tells us that what we've got now is a community of interdisciplinary scientists, a community of workforce, uh, a, a new workforce that is much more capable of uh, using data, computing that data effectively through increased analytical power and helping us make more joined up decisions. But of course that data needs to be sufficiently granular, it needs to be interoperable and it needs to be accessible and there are big challenge, challenges around that accessibility. Um, and then another Royal Society report, which took it a next step, really. It looked at digital technology and the planet, so no um, lack of ambition here. But I've put this slide up simply because what it says uh, was uh, looking at the way that uh, digital technology could be used to help us achieve some of the challenges under net zero. I don't know if you can read this, but what you can see here is uh, the key criticality of data at every point in understanding that. If you don't have the data, then you can't do the digital twins, you can't look at the feedback potential, you can't look at your assets and what changes you need to make. That means that you can't do the things around emissions reductions, around well-being, around resilience and around biodiversity. So, last slide, key messages. Um, I'd like 
to, I hope you might take from this presentation, is one, you know, the huge importance of geospatial data, but I call it dynamic ge geospatial data. It's not sufficient to just have a snapshot. We need to look at how it connects over time and how that data that data has impacts in other, other sectors, from one sector to the other. I've mentioned the need for join up across government departments because this challenge around land use will not be solved just through one department. And then the last thing I wanted to finish on is there is a wealth of data, geospatial data available through many of the UKRI data centres. I've just listed the ones here that are operated through the Natural Environment Research Council. I've mentioned, I've shown one picture from the Environmental Information Data Centre, but there are many other centres that will also give you that insight and analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Louise. And just a reminder to everybody that you can submit questions to Louise via Slido. And of course, you can also use hashtag IFG Databytes on Twitter. Uh, Louise, you may need to turn your camera uh, back on, possibly. Okay, thank you. So hopefully we'll be able to see you very shortly. There we are. Excellent. Thank you very much for that um, presentation. Um, I'll dive straight in with the first question, which is from Fiona at the Geospatial Commission, which is what one thing should the Geospatial Commission do on location data for improved environmental outcomes? OK, so I think I think the one the one thing is to um, reflect on the points I've been making about the dynamic nature of that data, that snapshots um, like land cover data might be a start point and it might be quite a challenge to get to that point of understanding how to make that data interoperable but it's got to be about how you um, how you make that data you know from a systems perspective how you think about how that data is going to impact on other parts of the system so from a geospatial commission perspective it's talking to lots of government departments huge challenge about getting everybody to buy into the need to a share data b make that data uh, interoperable uh, and and c then start asking probing questions of it really in a sense so it's that you know i keep saying this with joined up thinking but it is about joined up thinking and if the geospatial commission can help us do that we'll be a long way forward Excellent, thank you. Um, the next question comes from Lisa Allen, a former uh, Data Bytes presenter. She asks, what are the gaps that you have seen? Is it data or skills, both or more? Um, I would have said um, 10 years ago, for some of those old slides I was showing, it was the data. We're now at the point where the skills capabilities have grown um, immensely. I think the, the gap is actually harnessing those skills. So making sure that we have join up between people who measure and collect data and people who model that data and then departments, government departments and uh, private industry who need to understand how to use that data. So again, it's about the connectivity. The gap is around understanding that connectivity, which is why I showed that slide um, from the Royal Society, because what they were doing there was identifying that we've got a new cohort of people coming through the system to which interdisciplinarity is just normal behavior um, and actually uh, en enabling them to have the right sort of challenge to work across various sectors is a gap that's waiting to be filled as a community there we need to fill it in my view. Excellent, thank you. Um, we've got another really good question from Alistair Burt. Uh, he says, Louise, you mentioned the need to have better joined up government departments. And I can say from the Institute for Government point of view, that's something that we, we call for a lot as well. Uh, have you noticed any positive results from the joined up metro, mayoral, local government areas in recent years, bearing in mind their responsibility for local land use? And in fact, Joe Cudford from the Geos Geospatial Commission similarly asks, how important will it be to join up land use data and decisions between devolved administrations? Okay, so they're slightly different questions, so I'll take them one at a time. So thank, thank you, Alistair. A really good question there. Um, I think what what the Metro Mayors are doing is allowing sufficient challenge around the at the right sort of scale. So they've allowed us to start thinking about potential trade-offs, to start looking for potential win-win outcomes. So much of my research is about uh, trying to look, if you're trying to, for example, control flood risk, 
Are there other ways that you can also enhance biodiversity at the same time? Now, the Metromare concept and the fact that you're talking about bigger regional areas means that you can explore the needs across a much wider area than you could have done if you didn't have those sorts of setups in, in place. So I think it's, again, um, it's a platform to ask better questions of the data. And that, that platform will then help us move forward in terms of what data we need to keep collecting and how do we need to analyse it. Now, Joe's, Joe's question was a, an interesting one. And um, I, I guess the devolved, the devolved administration's question is also important because it happens, it, things are done differently in parts of the system and we can learn a lot from it. So I spent uh, seven years, five years, sorry, five years as chief scientific advisor to the Scottish government on rural affairs, food and environment. And um, what I found there was that the understanding around uh, geospatial data was actually a long way ahead of the game in terms of England. Uh, I don't know Wales, I've not worked with Wales an awful lot, but I think that's partly because um, you've got um, a, a huge resource that needs that needs to be understood. So, you know, 80% of the population live in 20% of the area in Scotland, and then you've got all that natural resource to reflect on. You also have a number of institutes, research institutes, that have uh, specialised in geospatial data one way or another. And that's allowed that question of, of the interplay between different parts of the system. There's also a strong, strong push around uh, land use and agriculture in Scotland that's slightly different uh, to England. A, a Canadian colleague of mine um, refers to England as a peri-urban environment and uh, perhaps he's right. Excellent, thanks. Um, we've got a question from Ruth Dixon. Evening to you, Ruth. Do you think the new agricultural, uh, th th sorry, do you think the new agriculture subsidies based on environmental land management will improve the quality of land use in the UK? And will we be able to track any changes with geospatial data? Um, will we? We need to, uh, is the answer to that last part of the question. We, we must be able to do that. Do I think it will um, make a difference? Yes, I think it will, but it will. I think what we've got to do is be patient because it will take time to do that. Now, I've spent a lot of my career working on phosphorus pollution. Um, now, phosphorus can sit in the soil system for maybe 50 years. So you might actually uh, develop some really interesting interventions that say we're going to cut phosphorus loss from land to water. But that impact might not be felt for many, many years. Um, most research is funded on a three-year time frame. Most government departments think on maybe even shorter time frames. So I think the, the real opportunity with the new schemes is to, is to give them time to actually develop and function rather than um, assuming they fail because they're not moving fast enough. Excellent. We've got about a minute left. So um, I suppose final question. Um, what does... To, what does success look like to you on all of this? What would you ideally like to see? What does your ideal world look like? Um, it, to, to me, it's about being able to have the, the data that's necessary at the right scale. Um, it's about having it accessible and finding ways to keep to, to allow different parts of the data, data, data needs to talk to one another. So those are all technical things that I think were 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 accomplishing quite rapidly. Then I think it's it, it's a question of really um, engaging with the stakeholders in that data. So the public, government departments, many many uh, organisations and businesses to start asking the right questions of it. So be much more um, proactive about the need to know. Um, I'm I'm very positive around the greater uh, increase in, in terms of co-creation of projects and designing projects with stakeholders from the, from the outset. Now, um, my experience in trying to get those sorts of research bids through UKRI is um, they're perceived as being really risky because you're starting off and saying, give us a lot of money because we've got a really good idea and we want to work with these stakeholders. We don't want to tell them what to do. We want them to tell us what they need and then we'll shape the research around the stakeholder need that. If you do that co-creation at the beginning, I think you get a much better outcome. So there's a, there's a bit of a journey there to go around achieving that. Excellent. Well, Louise, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, we now move to our final speaker of the evening, and that's Heidi. Heidi, over to you. Thanks very much, Gavin. So, gosh, some fascinating um, presentations that we've been listening to tonight. And hopefully what um, I'll be able to bring to you as, as your final speaker is a uh, is the private sector angle on this and the kind of work that we've been doing and experiences that we've been having in open data and geospatial data and, and what that means um, for us. Um, so you can uh, see from my next slide that um, Northumbrian Water is, a, is an operator of water and wastewater services. Um, we actually operate across two, two quite specific geographies. We're a water and wastewater company in the northeast. Um, and a water only company in Essex and Suffolk. And we've around about four and 4.4 million customers across those um, areas. And uh, it was lovely to hear um, Surian talking um, earlier on about the, the work that the water industry has been doing recently on tracking virus in sewers, because we've been participating um, in that programme with uh, collecting, collecting uh, samples around 15 uh, sewage treatment works in our area. So really interesting stuff, but that's not... Um, what I'm here to talk to you about tonight, it's really a, a combination of, of our journey on using um, open data and collaboration and why we do that. And then one particular uh, thing that, that grew out of that was, was born, if you like, a, I think of it as our little baby and now it's growing up uh, with the support of the Geospatial um, Commission. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But we firmly believe that collaboration, that openness, um, is the way to get better ideas. And there are so many challenges that as a water company we have to face, climate change being, I guess, an obvious one, the pandemic recently, things like water poverty, um, social deprivation, um, things like Louise was talking about, about there, the, the you know water quality and its catchments and how we treat it. So um, so getting involved with lots of different people and, and trying to, to grab hold of that data and see what it can do with is just totally and utterly caught a, to where we're coming from. And that's really why I've, I ended up here, I guess, tonight and, and to talk about what we think is as our poster child for um, collaboration is the is the National Underground Assets Register or UR as it's become. So this this all started back in um, in 2017 and we were trying to find a way of making open collaboration um, come to life um, and bringing people together in a, in a way where they could uh, do something, I guess, quite trusting um, and open. And um, now we used to bring people together in quite a conventional way. We used to have a conference, but we decided to do something a bit wacky and uh, set up our own innovation festival. So the idea was was in much the same way as you might have a corporate um, event, but we would stick everybody in, in fields in a tent in their best festival gear um, in the hope that that creativity and that slightly mad environment would really bring out the very best in people. Um, and they would build relationships. And so we all came together and we sprinted and hacked and dashed our way to finding different solutions to, to some of those problems. And the first event saw the generation of some really cool stuff. Um, so we decided to carry on um, doing it. Um, and we were particularly blessed in the next year that one of our festival tents, we put some, uh, some amazingly talented people from the Ordnance Survey, um, a company called One Spatial, um, as well as a whole load of asset owners um, from uh, outside of water. So UK Power Networks, Northern Gas Networks, Northern Power Grid, Open Reach, some local authorities. Um, and, and they started um, hacking about how could they share information in a, in a much better way. And what they wanted to do and what they came up with was the idea of having the ability to see all those cables and pipes. We've got, you can see the, the kind of numbers of, of, of mileage of pipes that we've got. Um, and have it all in one place. It seems like a really obvious idea, but for decades people have been trying to pull this off and they just haven't been able to do it. So the idea was that you could look down using your phone screen and see a fully comprehensive map of what was under your feet. Not just the cables, but information about them as well, like voltage, diameter, pipe material, depth. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a hell of a lot of it. And for us, particularly in water, it's a real challenge because water pipes are the, are the deepest where underneath everything else for obvious reasons, you don't want your water uh, burst going all over your electricity. So um, for us, we have to dig through everybody else's stuff before we even begin to get to our assets. And so that can be actually really quite dangerous. If we don't have a good idea of what we're digging through, um, it can be it can be deadly um, if we get that wrong. So um, we make we, we dig a hell of a lot of holes. We probably dig around about 100,000 excavations a year during our normal maintenance 
um, operations. Um, and in 2018, we spent uh, around about £1 million repairing assets that have been damaged by other utilities um, in doing their work as well. So a lot of time, wasted time, um, wasted money. And we reckon that if we could actually reduce the amount of accidental strikes um, on underground cables, we could probably save the UK economy somewhere in the region of £1.2 billion. And that seemed like a pretty good um, price to go after. So the concept was drafted up during the, fest the festival um, and the team walked out of the tent with a with a very simple prototype and actually did start digging holes in the middle of Newcastle Racecourse in a very safe way and not on the track where the horses were going to run. I'm sure you'd be pleased to, to know that um, and proved that they could that they were digging down exactly what they thought was there. So the consortium um, carried on. Um, the audience ordinance survey quickly developed a platform and after three months we had a working pilot which covered the whole of Sunderland Council's area and some 140,000 properties. And that brought us together, as I said, for the first time, an electronic underground city map with the help of those partners that we'd carried on with. So Northern Gas Networks, Northern Power Grid, Open Reach, as I said. And, uh, and actually the British Geological Survey had become involved by that point. We carried on, got very excited, um, built a, a sort of sandpit environment. And 12 months later, we'd done the whole of the Northeast and we'd got all 13 local authorities. So this was going viral, as you can say. We certainly weren't in our own little world. Everybody was putting their data sets on the table um, as well. Um, but it also started to expose, I think, quite a lot of quality problems um, with, the, with the data. But that's good in a way because it means that we started to improve that data as well. So we thought we had something great and um, we started to talk to government about it. We knew that collaboration um, was going to be the absolute key to this. Um, we knew that people needed to trust um, what they were doing with their data, be able to share it in a way that um, you know didn't didn't prejudice their commercial advantage. Um, and that's say when the Geospatial Commission got involved, um, and they we've they we've continued to work with them. Uh, they've done some incredible stakeholder engagement work, particularly with some of the. Um, organisations that were less trusting of this sharing environment, um, but got us to the point where everybody could see the real value of all of this and that actually being open with this data had to be the key to, to success. So in, in a relatively short amount of time, we've gone from a small little seed to, uh, to something really, really big um, and uh, really, really pleased with how it's going. And um, they're going to go live with this hopefully um towards oh sun's glaring on me is it right okay um hopefully that's a little bit better um and hopefully this will go national towards the end of this year which we're really pleased about but before i close if i can with my last minute i just want to invite you to innovation all of you that are on this call if you want to get involved and this is something that you think you could contribute to innovation festival 21 is running the theme is the brilliant get together it's going to be a hybrid of digital online and um, physically getting people together. Last year, we were operating in 37 countries in the world and 900 different organisations. So you're interested in open data, collaboration, solving problems together, then we would love to hear from you. Thanks very much. Thank you very, much, very much indeed, Heidi. Hi. Um, shining light in, in a number of different yeah. ways <laughs> during that, I think. Um, that's much better. That's a bit better. Perfect. It's a nice um, evening where I am. Lovely. Long, long may it continue. Yes. <laughs> Uh, just a reminder to everybody, you can put questions to Heidi via Slido. We've still we've got some coming in already or use hashtag IFG Databytes on Twitter. So we've got a really good first question from Anonymous. Again, good evening to you, Anonymous. Um, what's the feeling amongst the rest of the water industry with the innovation work that you're leading? Are they resistant to change or do they want to learn more from you? Well, I think it's been a really interesting journey. So when we did our first innovation festival in 2017, I think we had four of the um, other water companies. So they were brave souls, um, ventured up to the northeast, probably didn't quite know what they were going to, particularly as we told them to come in their best festival gear. And we stuck glitter on their faces as they walked through the door. Um, but but it, clearly that that was what made it spread. So everybody understood that there was such value in working together so that even though you might think you've got some great idea, to be honest, other people are going to help you work it up. Um, the, the, we work on sprints, so we we kind of try to condense typically a whole year's worth of work into a week and accelerate things um, together. So 
Um, so four years on, every single water um, company comes to the Innovation Festival. And I'm really, really pleased that I've heard today that it's actually going to be held partially in Australia with Sydney Water this year, um, right down by the Opera House. So isn't that incredible um, that people have seen um, that value? So we're sharing things um, and the industry is also at the moment working on a digital innovation sharing platform that we're leading on called the Centre of Excellence. So I think it's fair to say that people might have been sceptical four years ago, but now they are full on advocates um, and we're sharing loads. Excellent. Um, following on perfectly from that is a question from David Vincent, who says, great presentation, Heidi. On that question that you just answered, um, is what you've developed commercially exploitable by other utilities? And if so, how is access going to be arranged? Well, I think our, you know, our view about this was that, um, you know, this this would best fly if it was done in a in a in a collaborative environment and, and an open data environment. So we've effectively gifted um, everything that we've done on this, as, as have the other utilities that have worked with us. So, yes, it's been led by us as a water company, but as you heard me say, we've got um, electricity, telecoms, local authorities, um, all putting their data into this and seeing the value of this um, in, in people, you know, creating an asset that we can all use as opposed to something that somebody somewhere is going to, is going to try and exploit. And that was actually the key to it. If this had been a commercial organisation attempting to do this, I don't think people would have put their data in. So, um, you know, the fact that the Geospatial Commission and the Ordnance Survey have led on this is what's is what's got everybody into it. Excellent. And um, we've got another question from Lisa Allen. How are you dealing with the data quality issues discovered? Is it creating a feedback culture and improving the data overall? Yeah, so we haven't quite got to the point where we're going live nationally, but what has been happening, if you like, in the background, um, particularly as technologies have moved along, is we're getting much better at improving information, literally using technicians who are out in the field, adding new data, not just to our own data set, but you know, because they come across assets that are belonging to other operators. Um, and we're able much easier now to submit it to them and for them to be able to validate it against their own technical drawings and then update. So it's getting much, much, much better. But it's, I mean, it's an endless task to get this stuff right. Some of this stuff was was laid many, many, many years ago. Um, and just, you know, trying to to polish that data is, is will be a lifetime's work. Excellent. We've got another four minutes or so, so do keep your questions coming in. We've got a nice comment from Fiona at the Geospatial Commission, who says, thank you for your support, Heidi. The highlight of her time at the Geospatial Commission was getting her minister down the tunnels and on ITV. Um, something that you've talked about, um, a little, well, talked about a lot is the sort of importance of collaboration. You also talked about being able to bring a sort of private sector um, perspective to this, but also the importance of having a sort of public sector partner in the Geospatial Commission. What have been the sort of greatest challenges when it comes to collaboration? And has that been different depending on the type of body, whether it's public sector or private sector, that you've been collaborating with? Well, that's a that's an interesting um, question. Um, I think that in the in the private sector mode, I mean, the, the really interesting thing that, that seemed to push this along was as, as well as the technical um, work that the Ordnance Survey were doing with One Spatial and creating the tool that actually pulls together all this data and creates the, the map. We had all the lawyers from the different companies sat on a table in the, in the tent as well, and their challenge was to write the data sharing agreement in a week. Um, so you can imagine how that was, was going. But again, it, it comes down to, you know, if we try to do that through meetings um, and sending, you know, some updated version of it and some lawyers somewhere. You can imagine what that had gone like, but they couldn't do that because they were literally sat next to each other and the following morning they were going to have to explain why they hadn't done what they were supposed to have done. So so it is a really, really good way of accelerating things. Um, I think and uh, working with government, the, the, the scale has meant now that, that to a degree, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say it was slowing down, but... We are in that phase where we, you know, we know that we're laying um, the, the kind of the, the ground level for this going for something very important to be built on. So it is important that this bit gets right. So, I mean, I was talking to Talia earlier today. We have regular catch ups and she knows I'm just itching to get hold of this 
product in its national sense so that we can start using it in its fullest sense um, to, to help our operatives. But um, but it is right that we get it, we get all the protocols right because otherwise people won't want to adopt. And this whole system is relying on people being prepared to put their data in um, and to trust the platform. Excellent, thanks. Um, you talked tonight and in a blog post that you did for the Geospatial Commission about the importance of the culture of innovation. How do you sustain that between the sort of big events and across such a range of stakeholders? Uh, in, in lots of different ways. So so we we took the, the view that innovation was everybody's job. Um, sometimes organisations have innovation departments, but we wanted everybody to to play. So we have um, a, a big um, group of innovation ambassadors, um, so around about 100 of them all over the company who are, who are always uh, doing a, a range of different things. We run innovation competitions. In fact, we just launched um, our Invest Quest, which is a little bit like a Dragon's Den. Um, internal Dragon's Den is, is just opened at the moment. I was um, launching that on a, on, a, on a broadcast that I do in the company with last year's winners. Um, who've just won a national award for their work um, to create a mobile wastewater sampling um, uh, trailer, which was which was just brilliant. So that's opportunities for employees to to win financial backing from from the company for their idea, um, and people you know love all of that kind. So we're always looking for a beat rate of something to happen all the way through the year. But the festival is definitely the kind of crescendo of it all, and people you know are, are waiting for that all year and and wanting to play play a part. Final 30 seconds, so a final quick question. Um, what what do you ultimately want to achieve with all of this? What does success look like? Um, well, I think in terms of what we're talking about tonight, if, if we get the National Underground Asset Register to be a national database, then I, honestly, I will... Uh, my, myself and all my colleagues that have worked on that. I mean, that is an that's an incredible ambition of, uh, met, isn't it, for any company to have taken something, developed in a tent, and and grown from a seed to something that's a, that's that's been used by all utilities, local authorities, and anybody who wants to dig a hole basically without hitting something. Um, I, I will just burst with pride if we get that far, and I'm, and we will because it's going to happen. Excellent. Well, very best of luck with it. And um, thank you very much uh, for taking part tonight. Thank you. So um, just a few parish notices from me before we conclude for the evening. Uh, the first thing to say is, of course, um, that we will be having some virtual drinks afterwards. So hopefully the details of that will be going up on screen as I'm speaking. So please do come along for a bit. Um, obviously, you'll have to bring your own drinks. Uh, at some point, we may be back in a physical location. We'll be able to actually go for drinks uh, afterwards, but not just yet. Um, our next event, as I said earlier, will be on uh, will be at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, the 7th of July, our last one before summer break. Of course, there's lots more coming up at the Institute for Government, uh, events on everything from COVID public inquiries to the meaning of global Britain and the meaning of levelling up. So plenty to keep you busy over the next few weeks. And all that remains for me to say um, is sort of three very big thank yous. First of all, a huge thank you to the Geospatial Commission uh, for supporting us tonight and uh, allowing us to run this Geospatial. Uh, we're very grateful to them. And again, if you would be interested in sponsoring a future Data Bytes event, please do get in touch with us. A second massive thank you is to all of you for watching. You've been a brilliant audience with lots of really great questions. And again, sorry to all of those uh, whose questions I wasn't able to get through. Uh, very busy Slido tonight. And finally, please join me in a virtual round of applause for our fantastic uh, presenters this evening. A huge amount of ground covered, literally and figuratively. Um, so a huge thank you to them. And uh, look forward to seeing you hopefully at virtual drinks. And if not, see you next month. Thank you very much. <laughs>